Chapter 13, Expansion, War, and Sectional Crisis, 1844 to 1860. So this chapter is talking about the coming of the Civil War. So, of course, we've been talking about that for a while, but, but this is a long kind of process. Most of the first half of the 19th century, you know, each each incident and event that happens is one more step towards this, this war that's going to dis decide the fate of this country, okay? So this chapter looks also at the westward expansion movement, the continuing of it, the idea of manifest destiny. So we've seen this image before, but just to review, you, you have the angel floating across the land. She's coming from east to west. Behind her, it's bright and enlightened, and you have what's considered to be progress. You see on the far le uh, right, the uh, cities are, are, you know, lots of commerce and river trade and factories and you know, a bustling business. Then you see, of course, the the uh, trains coming across the land, bringing people, the stagecoaches, the Pony Express, covered wagons and settlers, miners. This is all the future. This is progress. And, and as, as the angel floats across the land below her, this is what happens. In her hand, she's got a she's got books for knowledge. You can't see it, but she's also you see the you see the telegraph wire here. She's got the wire in her hand and she's stringing it across as she goes to to create communications, you know, for these settlers to have. Uh, in front of her, it's darker and it's the past. So who's who's a who's a part of the past? Native Americans. Buffalo. These are this is the past, and they're all running from her to get away from her. So this this is the idea. This is the ideology of manifest destiny, and this idea that it is their God-given right that God has ordained these people to do this and push every anybody out of the way that gets in their way. So because of this ideology and this belief and this ordained by God. The, the American settlers felt it was their right to expand across the continent. This is right out of your book. It belongs of right to the United States to regulate the future destiny of North America. Our national boundary is the Pacific Ocean. Of course, they don't, they don't have those lands yet. It's not their lands yet, but they, they are anticipating that they will be. Okay, And of course, not that far away they will be. So even by the time of the Louisiana Purchase, America was... I'm pushing their boundaries all the way to the West, all the way to the Pacific Ocean. And they believed it was their duty, ordained by God, to civilize and convert any native or, in their minds, savage people. Okay? Let's take our first break and start this class with the film. Please watch the film War and Expansion, Crash Course, U.S. History, number 17. Watch the film and then come on back. Okay, so you're going to go west, but how do you get there? There's no roads or trains or transport systems or airplanes. It's just there's nothing. There's, there's How do you do it? It's overgrown. Uh, all you really have are Native American foot, foot trails. They didn't live the same way. They, you know, they, they, they lived lightly in the land. So how do you get there? But they also realize that the Native Americans would need to be subdued in the west. They've already been subdued in the in the east, from the Mississippi to the Atlantic, by the by this era, the you know uh, early eight nineteenth century, Native Americans in in the in the east and New England have been pushed out. They've been removed from the south, so they're they are no longer a threat in the east. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. We remember the Indian Removal Act of 1830 and Jackson going against the Supreme Court, getting them out. But they have not been removed in the West. In fact, they haven't really even faced the white people yet. Okay, so they've been around for 200 years by this time, but they haven't gone West in great numbers. So the question is is asked: How do we get rid of the Native Americans in the West? You know, how how do we sub subdue them there? Uh, this would um, result in what became known as the Indian Wars. You're going to have a lot of a lot of battles and wars. It's going to be a, a conflict. It's not going to be a nice thing. This is a this is an ugly chapter here where you have wars with natives to to, to get rid of them. Uh, okay, another manifest destiny quote. Our manifest destiny is to overspread the continent allotted by providence for the free development of our yearly multiplying millions. And again, fated by God to settle the North American continent, regardless of who is there. Okay, 
so this is a this is a widely held belief by these people that it was their destiny to, to move across the continent to spread their traditions and their institutions, not not anybody else's, just theirs. And enlightening these primitive nations, uh, these people considered Indians, Hispanics to be inferior and therefore deserving of cultivation. Uh, they considered the United States to be the best possible method to organize a society and culture. And they felt the need to remake the world in the image of their own country. Okay, um, Americans believed that God blessed the growth of the American nation and even demanded of them to actively work on it since they were sure of their cultural and racial superiority. <clears throat> They felt that their destiny was to spread their rule around and enlighten the nations that were not so lucky. They firmly believed in the virtue of the American people and their mission to impose their virtuous, so again, mainly Puritan way of life on everybody else. There's that Puritan work ethic again. We remember that. This idea of working hard to prove to God that you're worthy. Uh, so this kind of rhetorical background served to explain the acquisition of territories and reasons to go to war. Uh, and we're going to see that here shortly with this war with Mexico in the 1840s. Uh, so the Southwest is gazed upon fondly as the last piece of the puzzle. Last chapter was Texas. Now they're looking at the next piece. You're going to complete the coast to coast country if you can do that. Okay. So what is the chronology of um, manifest destiny? Uh, you know, what events happen in this ideology? So you, so you really got to look at the land and the events that transpired there. It, it really starts with Oregon. So Oregon country in those days, much larger than it is today. Uh, Oregon, you see the, the, the green there. Uh, almost half of that's in Canada today. And of course, the entire state of Washington is included too. So, But in those days, it was the Oregon country. It was very large. And people want to come here. Why, why Oregon? Very rich lands, rich soil, accessible harbors. So settlers came across the Oregon Trail. And here you see it, this trail right here. This brings them into the Willamette Valley, which is where Portland, Oregon is today. Uh, this is a very popular destination. And a quarter million people come across this trail to populate Oregon, but also California, Wyoming, Idaho, uh, and Montana. Uh, interesting, 1844, Oregon, Oregon passed the what's called the Black Exclusion Law, prohibited African Americans from entering the territory. OK, uh, in, in, interesting idea. Um, you see here, I'm not going to read all this, but the Constitution of Oregon cuts off free Negroes from the privilege of citizens. Humphrey Marshall of this state voted against the admission. Was Humphrey's opposition to the new state caused by the anti-free N-word clause in the Constitution? We hope this question will be answered by the Free N-Word Convention, which meets here in the 22nd. It's a proper question to be discussed and settled at this powwow. So these people are being blatantly racist. We don't want black people in this in our territory. And they impose voting restrictions and they they you know while they're while they're prohibiting black people from coming they're also prohibiting slavery okay and 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 they make it very clear uh only free male descendants of white men would be able to vote would be allowed to vote so pretty uh pretty clear about where where they were coming from okay this is going to be a a society based on white supremacy Okay, California is another destination, and we think of it as the garden spot today, but very sparsely populated in our era, hardly anybody there at all. Most of the people that came settled in the northern interior along the Sacramento River, but where Sacramento is, the city of Sacramento is today, but very remote, mostly native peoples. There had been a European influence there, but it had been a while. Uh, the Spanish had built the mission system 60, 70 years earlier. Uh, in an attempt to control the land. We talked about how the Russians were coming up down from Alaska in a kind of a race for California. So that had been happening. But other than that, the entire state was mostly native and very sparsely populated. Um, so before this era, Mexico won their independence from Spain. 
so we we think back on on Spain. Okay, this goes way back to our first chapter with the conquistadors and Hernan Cortez and disease and and how they did that. Right, they they didn't have much of a of a challenge to to take over because most people died. But it's been 300 years since that that era, but yet the Spanish are still are still in you know in power. Uh, but Mexico wins its independence in 1821. Okay, let's go to our next film here. This is entitled "The Mexican War of Independence." Uh, please watch that that uh, film and come on back. <clears throat> okay, so the land that is now Mexico became a territory of of Spain before in August 1521 with Hernan Cortes, and we were his army of conquistadors toppled the Aztecs. And, and we remember that from, from a while back. So 1810, there starts to be a, a movement towards getting gaining independence from Spain for Mexico. So a man named Miguel Hidalgo y Costilla, uh, a respected Catholic priest, issues this passionate rallying cry. It's known as the Grito de Dolores, or the Cry of Dolores. Uh, this is a... a uh, a document that he reads in the town of Dolores, that's where it gets its name, and it's publicly read. It was a declaration of war against the colonial Spanish government. The Grito called for the end of Spanish rule in Mexico and then for a redistribution of land and racial equality. So the Spanish were harsh and oppressive. We we go back to the early days, uh, the encomenderos and uh, those people that gained those lands and you got the people with it and you made lots of money. And these weren't nice people. So the, the Mexican people are looking to gain independence from them, okay? Uh, and looking to also, and to, so to, to get rid of the inequality of wealth to make it more fair, but racial equality also. So Hidalgo extends his call to arms to mestizos, mixed race, people of indigenous descent also. And this, this would be a significant contribution of, of manpower that would help him and gave, gave the movement an in, more of an increased chance of victory. So Hidalgo led his growing militia from village to village, spreading the word, recruiting as he goes en route to Mexico City. <clears throat> but he's, he stopped at Calderon in January 1811, and he's defeated there. Uh, he flees north but was captured and then executed by Spanish authorities in the town of Chihuahua. But, but the revolution didn't die. Others picked up the, the helm and took it and ran with it. This, this revolution keeps going. Now it's in his name. Uh, and the, the new leaders led armies of indigenous and racially mixed revolutionaries against the Spanish royalists. And this is the Mexican War for Independence. Uh, and they finally win this independence in 1821. So it goes on for 11 years before they finally are successful. And the Treaty of Cordoba established Mexico as an independent constitutional monarchy. Okay. And then 18 months later, you have the <clears throat> rise of Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana. We talked about him last chapter at the, <clears throat> in the Texas Revolution. <clears throat> he ousts the emperor and established the first Mexican Republic, okay? Uh, and as we know, he brings in this kind of harsh, oppressive government also. So you get rid of one, and another one comes in. <clears throat> but, but truthfully, the victory against Spain released the Native Americans, the Indians, if you, want to, if you want to call them that, released them from the Spanish rule. They've been subjugated and discriminated against by Spanish monks in the mission system for 300 years. Uh, so after independence, Mexico secularized the missions, took religion out of it, and the and Catholicism, and it ended. And the Spanish uh, uh, culture was all about religion and Catholicism. You had to be a Catholic. These people say we're going to take that away. You don't have to be anything. We're going to take religion out of this. Uh, so this this ended this post-war society from being controlled by the Catholic religion, the way that many had had in the past. So after secularization, a rancho system was developed. These huge parcels of land 
were given out, mostly raised cattle. So this is different than the southeast where you have plantations and cotton and crops because down there you've got a lot of uh, weather and, and, and rain and nutrients from the Mississippi River. Now you're in the west, dry, very little water, and not always the greatest weather, many times very hot. So cattle becomes the, the uh, product in the west versus crops in the east. And the, and the people that were here traded their hides, traded tallow with New Englanders. So that's all the way across the country. So this is the first time that California enters the American economy by trading with New England in this, in this era. Okay, So who, who's living in California in this era? Uh, these are called the Californios, Spanish-speaking Catholic people of Latin American descent, mostly born in Alta, California between 1769. That would be when the mission system begins. In 1848, that would be when the Mexican-American War ends, okay? So where is Alta California? Well, well, like the Oregon Territory, Alta California is much bigger then than California is now. In fact, it, it included the entire, nearly the entire southwest portion of the present-day United States. <clears throat> so the Californians are living here, and they're, they were mostly elite families. They, they had received large land grants from Spain. And then after Spain, even from Mexico. And these people flourished during the 1830s to 1880s. What were they doing? Well, some, some were cultivating crops and orchards, but large-scale cattle ranching on large ranchos was the key to their wealth. And, of course, we had this stereotypical large ranch in the West. These people kind of start this before the white Europeans come. So nearly all aspects of California society were connected to its relationship to the land. So in their minds, there was opportunity in Alta California, and even poorer families could establish a cattle ranching business. They also gave women opportunity. A married woman in the Spanish system was allowed to own her own property even if her husband died. This was very rare in the world at that time. It wasn't being done at all in, in Europe or on the east coast of the United States, male dominance. Uh, but not so here. So the, it meant that many women, especially widows, could become even very rich and politically powerful in Alta California, uh, where there was plenty of land to buy and lots of opportunity. Okay. So as, as the settlers are coming in this idea of manifest destiny, they're, they're of course, coming up with some kind of plan what are we going to do with these people so as they come across the land they're going to be they're going to be in the plains they're going to enter the plains first so the plains is a large area you see the shady area in the map right there pretty much the entire middle of the united states all the way from south texas uh to the mississippi to the uh east to the rocky mountains to the west and all the way up into canada to the north this huge swath across this entire country and you have lots of people living there, the Plains Indians. They, they, that's a European name. They didn't call themselves that, but these are the people living on the Plains. What's the Plains? It's kind of like a step. Not very many, much water, very dry, grasslands, not very many trees. This, this is what the Plains are even today. Uh, so this, in, this included the people living there, the Blackfoot, the Cheyenne, the Sioux, the Pawnee, Crow, Comanche. Kiowa, Arapaho, as well as others. And what resulted is the adoption of a culture that was shared by all of them. Uh, Plains Indians tended to do and live the same way. The climate, land, the natural raw materials that were available to them, as well as the animals, fish, birds, plants, nuts, berries, trees, all these were centered to the lives of the Indian tribes in this er area. Uh, these raw materials also provide their clothing. So their subs subsistence was related to agriculture and hunting. But without question, the, the center of their world was the buffalo hunt and the buffalo themselves. Uh, and we've talked about this before. The, the natives saw the buffalo as sacred and that they loved the buffalo and they prayed to the buffalo. And when they killed one, they would, they would pray over it and thank it for its sacrifice. So there were, there were 
li literally hundreds of thousands of buffalo everywhere in the plains. It wasn't hard to find one. But the Native Americans wouldn't hunt and, and, and kill 20 of them. They'd, they'd kill one of them because that's all they needed. And they would they would use every part of the animal from the from the meat to the furs, you know, furs for teepees and, and blankets and clothing and the, and the bones for tools and the organs for, for oil and, and, and so on. They, they would use every part of it. OK, that so it was an integral part of their life was the buffalo hunt. But but also religion, worship of the great spirit was key to their beliefs. They did a dance called the Sundance, and that was a way to show respect and love for their gods. Uh, they, this this would take place. This this Sundance ceremony would take place over the span of four days. Much of it spent staring up at the sun. Uh, to the weather, the changing seasons affected their way of life at different times of the year, of course. Uh, but but a a big change for them is the horses. So Plains Indians became expert horsemen. Where'd they get the horses from? Were they always there? No, they were not. The white European settlers brought them. So they had they didn't have horses before that. Okay, so this greatly changed their lives. They became expert horsemen, hunters, and this enabled enabled them to adopt a nomadic lifestyle that would allow them to follow the the great herds of animals every, anywhere they went. So life in the plains for these people were very different and horses revolutionized entire tribes and started new cultures. And they abandoned their mostly sedentary lifestyle. They, be, they became nomads in less than a generation. So hunting became more important for most tribes because this expanded their range. Uh, they were able to have more frequent contact with distant tribes. Of course, that's good for trade, but it also increased the likelihood of competition and warfare. So a person's wealth was measured in horses, and great honors came to those who would capture them from an enemy. So much like the South, where a man's wealth was measured by how many slaves you owned, in this culture it was measured by how many horses you owned. So the tribes became more efficient with the horse, better hunters, better warfare, you could pack up and move faster and easier, uh, change their lives considerably. But like before, like in the East, like in Mexico, like in South America, when these people came for the first time and these native people first have contact with these European people, these their diseases take their toll. Like the others, they had no immunities to these diseases the Europeans had. So the, the diseases continued to kill every time and everywhere that they went. Anywhere where white Europeans came into contact with Native Americans, this would happen. And nobody could figure out what this was, okay? Um, it was pretty clear that it just so happens simultaneously that with the arrival of the Europeans, everybody gets sick and dies. But no one knew where they were coming from. If I, So they bring these diseases and uh, like like I said before, they didn't realize that they were doing it, but they bring it, okay? And people people die. If I could see this thing, if I knew where it came from, I would go there and fight it. But they don't know what it is, okay? And so understand, the Europeans didn't come to the plains till much later. So it's been 200 years. Well, actually 300 years since uh, Cortez. So all those years later, now the now the white Europeans are coming coming west, and all the natives begin to die. So it, it's still happening. Uh, so and of course, besides the problem of a lot of people dying, it the majority of people die. It's difficult to create a useful defense against these people. Okay, so like in everywhere else they'd been when the when the white settlers. And these are Americans now, right? This is the United States has been has been uh, organized and developed. Anywhere they came, they didn't face much of a challenge because most people would die. Okay. Uh, okay. So the stage is kind of set with the people that were there in the plains in the west, southwest, for this idea of manifest destiny. Okay. Let's change directions here and talk about. Politics. So you have this election of 1844. This will boil down to Henry Clay versus James Polk. So there's Henry Clay still trying to be elected. And there's two looming issues facing this election. What to do about Texas and Oregon. 
Uh, Great Britain was lobby lobbying for control of Texas. Great Britain. Do these people ever go away? They're still around. Uh, <clears throat> they're, they're trying to gain control of Texas. So this is partly why the American government finally annexed Texas and brought them as, as a state to thwart the efforts of the, of the British of stealing it from them. Uh, but Great Britain had their their interests elsewhere. Also, they were they were positioning themselves to take charge of California, Oregon. You know, both were popular destinations, as as we said, for settlers moving west. Great Britain was trying to gain control of Cuba. So, what is what does all this mean? They're blatantly ignoring the Monroe Doctrine. We we read the Monroe Doctrine. Don't come here. We, if you come here with any kind of colonization, you know. Uh, aspect or anything like that, we're going to see it as an act of war. But here they're doing it, okay? <clears throat> okay, so the front runners initially in this election were Henry Clay the, of the Whig Party and Martin Van Buren, the Democrat that had been the president before. <clears throat> uh, but the annexation of Texas is a big one, and both parties feared that that's going to split their parties, okay? <clears throat> so, so Clay easily won the Whig nomination, but but Van Buren ran into trouble at the Democratic convention, and he he did not win the win the uh, the nomination. A, a, a huge surprise to most people, and for the first time in American history, a true dark horse candidate was nominated. But what does a dark horse candidate mean? It's a candidate who had received little <clears throat> notice before the convention but then is nominated. So on some levels, Donald Trump was a dark horse. Nobody expected, you know, even, even a year away from the 2016 election that he would actually be nominated, but here he gets nominated, okay? <clears throat> so who's the dark horse? James Polk of Tennessee. He, he appeals to the delegates because he's a protege of Andrew Jackson. They call him Young Hickory. They call Jackson Old Hickory. This is Young Hickory. So Polk won the 1844 nomination, uh, and he's running against Clay. And it was a very bitter campaign. Clay was very confident of victory. Uh, but Polk and the Democrats, so James Polk, uh, they're, they're pro-expansionists, and they got aggressive, calling for the reoccupation of Oregon and the reannexation of Texas. Kind of an interesting idea. Neither one you'd, you'd ever had before, but you, now you're going to reoccupy and reannex these state or these territories. Okay, so Polk's idea, his platform was about taking control of these of these territories, uh, and and when speaking about Oregon, used his very famous campaign slogan, fifty four forty or fight. So fifty four forty was the line of latitude serving as the northern boundary of Oregon. So they're saying anything below that, if you want to push the boundary, you know, uh, diminish it, we're going to fight you. Uh, Polk's plan was to claim and go to war with the entire tentry, uh, I'm sorry, territory for the United States, take the whole thing, while condemning British presence in the northwest. So this this kind of came as a shock to Clay. He's 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 forced to switch his position on annexation, but it came too late. Uh, he was labeled as a drunkard, but Polk was labeled as an unknown. Who's James K. Polk? Nobody had heard of him before. A dark horse. But amazingly, Polk's margin in the electoral college was substantial, and he surprisingly won. Okay. So Polk comes to power, and it becomes his administration is about war, expansion, and slavery. Okay, so let's do our supplemental lecture 13 right here called the Mexican-American War. This is one of the first, you know, uh, incidents that happens in the Polk administration. So let's do our sketch outline number one: background development. Letter A: manufactured war. Letter B: border dispute. Number two, control of California, letter A, Fremont, F-R-E-M-O-N-T. And then we'll have a sub letter for him, number one, uh, Bear Flag Revolt. Okay, then, then back to uh, B, <coughs> excuse me, Kearney, K-E-A-R-N-Y. And we'll have a sub letter for him, number one, Sam Pasquale. Okay, back to number three, for and against. So who's for and who's against this war? People that were four, letter A is four, sub, sub num, number one, 
many Americans were pro-expansion. Uh, letter B, who's against this war? Letter number one, conscious Whigs, Grant, Ulysses S. Grant, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, number four, <clears throat> annex all of Mexico? Question mark. Letter A, did not want to mix races? Letter B, the John Calhoun comment. And then finally, number five, relevance. In the end, because of this manufactured war, Mexico had lost about half of its territory, including nearly all of present-day California, Utah, Nevada, Arizona, and New Mexico. So like I said before, they just lost Texas 10 years earlier. Now they're going to lose the entire southwest of the United States. This, this, this will hurt Mexico considerably, okay? So the Mexican-American War has begun. This, is, this, this war was the first war chiefly fought on foreign soil, okay? At that time, Mexico was politically divided and militarily unprepared. They're, they were still hurting from, from losing Texas. So it was Mexico in that kind of state versus the expansionist-minded administration of the new President Polk, who believed in manifest destiny to spread America across the continent to the Pacific Ocean. So I've said before it was a manufactured war. So the United States wants that land. They want that, that those Mexican session lands, all those southwestern states. And to be fair, they did try to buy it, but Mexico would not sell them. It's too valuable. You can't put a price in that land. But America wants it no matter what. So how do they manufacture a war? Well, there's, there was a dispute about the border of Mexico and Texas, okay? Uh, so today, you see the Rio Grande River here at the bottom. This is this is the current uh, border of, of between Mexico and Texas today. It's the river, okay? But in those days, the Mexican government was arguing that the Nueces River up here is where the border should be, which, of course, would give them all these lands that were in this kind of orange uh, shade here, okay? So this is a border dispute. These things happen on occasion, and for the most part, you work it out. You negotiate, you compromise, whatever. But America saw it as here's our chance to go to war and we'll we'll win easily and we'll get these lands. Okay. So the Mexican American War begins and it, it started from a, a minor border skirmish along the Rio Grande. Uh <clears throat> The war breaks out in 1846. So when the war begins, the United States Army only had 8,000 men in it. But very quickly, 60,000 volunteers joined their ranks. Going to war was an adventure and an honor to men in those days. In this war, the American Navy would dominate the sea. The American government would provide stable, capable leadership. And, of course, their economy far surpassed that of the fledgling at that time Mexican state. Morale was on the American side, expansion, expansion, go to the Pacific. Uh, so this was followed by a series of United States victories for the most part. And this war ended up being pretty much a rout, okay? And and Polk would direct the war from Washington, D.C. He, he ran the show. A couple of key people in this story, especially for us in California, are John Fremont, who we'll talk about here further in a minute, and Stephen Kearney, okay? So when you hear Kearney Mesa and Kearney this and Kearney that, it's a popular name you see in San Diego. This is where it comes from, Stephen Kearney. Uh, both these men were sent to control by Polk, the coveted lands of California and New Mexico. Even though these were parts of Mexico, they're sparsely populated and weren't hard to control. Polk wants to grab grab these choice lands early, Okay. But, but Fremont kind of goes in a different direction. He, he comes to California. He leads a group of Californians to declare independence, much like Texas had done. Uh, yeah, so, so he pushes for a California republic uh, kind of out of the blue. So even before word of hostilities reached the West, Fremont's pushing for his own republic. And this is entitled the Bear Flag Revolt. This doesn't last very long, a couple of months, but this is where the present day flag of California comes from. This flag was the flag flown by these revolutionaries trying to create California as its own republic, its own country. Very, very short lived independence rebellion, but settlers in the Sacramento Valley, 
you know, uh, rebel against the Mexican authorities. I mean, they didn't have very many people. There were 500 Americans living in California at that time, compared to eight to 12,000 Mexicans. So not not very fair numbers. But in June, a dozen Americans, 12, they seized a large herd of horses from a Mexican military commandant. And on June 14th, another group captured the town of Sonoma. Uh, Sonoma was the chief settlement north of San Francisco. <clears throat> and they issued this Declaration of Independence and hoisted this bear flag. Uh, flag okay, uh, Grizzly bear face and a red star and a white background. Uh, so Fremont arrives at Sonoma on June 25th, and he gives his support to the Bear Flag Revolt. And on July 5th, they elected Fremont to be the head of the Republic of California. So he's kind of making a little end run here. He's trying to gain some power himself. But the movement was not taken seriously by the American government, and it was quick to fall. July 9th, <clears throat> Uh, the fo forces under Commodore John D. Slope, the American Navy, show up in San Francisco. They occupy San Francisco and Sonoma, and they claimed California for the United States. <clears throat> and they replaced the bear flag with the American flag. So Fremont and his followers didn't didn't fight back. They didn't expect that they were going to be able to do that. They they just fall back into the fray. Okay, we're with you. We're we're with the Americans still. They march on to Monterey. They capture the Mexican Presidio there, the four. Remember we talked about the, the four harbors had forts. They capture that one. By 1847, for the most part, California was secure in this Mexican-American war. The war will go on for one more year. So there, there, is, there was a battle that happened in California, in fact, in San Diego County, and this is the Battle of San Pasqual. So this this is where Kearney went. So then going back to the two men that came, we talked about about uh, Fremont. This is Kearney. So Kearney, a frontiersman, pretty famous frontiersman named Edward Beale. Kit Carson, you've heard of Kit Carson Park. It's called that to, you know after Kit Carson, who fought who fights this battle just kind of up the valley from where Kit Carson Park is, out by the Wild Animal Park. If you've ever been out there, there's a, a museum and a kind of a, a, a battlefield out there. So this battle would be a defeat for the American army. Kearney was defeated. Um, this would be the worst defeat the American army experienced in the entire war, although truthfully, it was not much more than a skirmish, okay? <clears throat> okay, let's uh, take a look at a short film here about the legacies <clears throat> of the Mexican-American War. And this is called Reflecting on the Mexican-American War. Please watch that film and then come on back. Okay, so this, this war was popular to a lot of people in those days. Like I said before, adventure, honor, and many people, their hats in. Let's go to war. Sure. Uh, let's gain some land. Expansion opportunities. There's, there's a fervor to, to expand all the way to the Pacific Ocean. But there were also people that were against it. Uh, the Conscience Whigs, a, a segment of the Whig Party, <clears throat> they felt the war divided the country and were completely against it. Many of them felt it was immoral, and these became known as the Conscience Whigs. Uh, page 421 of your book, they accused Polk of waging a war of conquest to add new slave states. All you need to do is, is, add, is create more opportunity for slavery. Uh, and that would give, of course, the slave-owning Democrats permanent control of the federal government. Okay, Ulysses S. Grant called it a wicked war, so he fought in the war. Now, in the Mexican-American War, he was not a famous person. He would become famous later in the Civil War. Okay, but he was there and saw it, and he 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 thought it was causeless, wicked, and unjust. America was called murderers and robbers. And this is a quote from Grant's memoirs that he would write at the end of his life, looking back on it. I was bitterly opposed to the measure and to this day regard the war, which resulted as one of the most unjust ever waged by a stronger against a weaker nation. I do not think there was ever a more wicked war. I thought so at the time, only I had not moral courage enough to resign. So what's he saying? America's being a bully, okay? Stronger against a weaker nation. They, the Mexico had no chance to survive this. So you're going to win, and they knew it. And and 
Grant sees this as, you know, that this is not a good thing. Even Abraham Lincoln, he calls this war immoral, pro-slavery, and a threat to the nation's Republican values. So those are some pretty, you know, um, uh, famous people that are criticizing this war. So when I say it was a manufactured war to gain Mexican lands, that's not my point of view or that something that I came up with. This, this is this is what it was thought of even back then. And these are see, these are some pretty famous people that are are agreeing with that idea. Okay. So anti-war activists and Whig leaders they they kind of react. What's what is this manifest destiny all about? It doesn't seem like it's going. It's very fair. Uh, Way with this wretched cant about manifest destiny, a divine mission to civilize and Christianize and democratize our sister republics at the mouth of a cannon. Sister republics, talking about Mexico, that's your neighbor, and you're going to go down there and beat them up and take their lands at the mouth of a cannon. Okay, so a lot of people are against this war. Um, it split the Democratic Party. This happens many times with wars. People have different points of view about it. And it was felt that the, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, this all happened over this minor border dispute. It's not enough of a reason to go to war. So they accused Polk of, of instigating a war. But he says, no, the American blood was shed in American soil in this border dispute. That's why we went to war. Okay. Many people think that it's the power of slavery here. It's aiming to govern the country, its constitution and laws. That what this is all about is is expanding slavery. Polk was a Southerner, okay? Uh, <clears throat> David Wilmot of Pennsylvania, a congressman, uh, he proposes the Wilmot Proviso uh, that slavery should be banned in all territories gained from the war. Uh why? Because of the fear of the addition of a pro-slave territory. We already talked about Texas. So that was not a state. It was not part of America, but it was a slave slave territory. Uh, so this, this, of course, inflames the growing controversy over slavery. Uh, this resulted in a huge backlash from the South to the idea that you're going to ban. Like, are you nuts? We We – Fought this war to gain these lands, and now you're going to say we're going to ban slavery? That's that's not going to happen. So the measure was blocked in the Southern-dominated Senate, although it passed in the House. Okay, uh, but people are angry, and according to the newspaper, the Richmond Enquirer in Virginia, a Southern newspaper, the Mad Men of the North have we fear cast the die and numbered the days of this glorious union. And that would be prophetic because that's exactly what's going to happen. You're going to have a civil war. Okay. The Polk Democrats responded by calling for the annexation of the entirety of Mexico, the entire country that, that it is today. And only the fear of assimilating numbers of non whites into American society stopped the idea. The white settlers didn't want to integrate Mexican people, Indian people. Native American people into their society, so they let it go, okay? But it came that close to annexing the entire country. So if you can imagine today, United States and Mexico being all the United States, that came very close to happening. But they don't, it's it's racism. They don't, they don't want to mix with non-white people. And even John C. Calhoun, a, a former vice president, makes it pretty clear that this is the point of view about Manifest Destiny. Ours is a government of the white man, which should never welcome into the Union any but the Caucasian race. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So the end of the lecture here with relevance. In the end, because of this manufactured war, Mexico had lost about half of its territory, including nearly all of present-day California, Utah, Nevada, Arizona, and New Mexico. So the second large piece of land is lost and there's there's the there's the size of it right there on the on the image you just lost texas 10 12 years before now you lose all of that so mexico is losing land lands land creates wealth and power and you're losing it and they get their 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 holdings are cut in half this is not very long after they they gain their own independence maybe 20 25 years later uh 
Of course, the tragic part for Mexico about this is this war ends in 1848. <clears throat> I've probably mentioned it before, but 1848 is when gold is discovered in Sacramento. This makes the American government very wealthy, but Spain, I'm sorry, Mexico was already gone. Okay, so tragic timing for for Mexico to lose all this territory, okay? Okay, that is the end of Chapter 13, Part 1. Please go on to Chapter 13, Part 2. Thank you.